Alhamdulillah, as every Friday evening for the last at least 10 weeks now, it's been my honor and my pleasure to welcome and greet you to another session in the study of comparative religion as a tool for Dawah. Alhamdulillah, this is our last session in this series of lectures. And tonight's topic, inshallah, we'll try to cover it two-part topic, a two-part topic. The title of tonight's talk, titles, Is Christianity a Cult? Part one. And the second part of our talk is Who are the Jehovah Witnesses? Uh, before we embark on tonight's discussion, inshallah, I just want to remind you that the tapes from the previous class and the previous two classes uh, are available here, inshallah. Uh, they can be acquired uh, from Brother Ali, who you see standing now in the back uh, during the break or after the class, inshallah. We, we recommend that you get those tapes and inquire of the brother of any other tapes that's available, either in this series of lectures or any other uh, tapes that might be available from him. I'd also like to announce that, inshallah, next week we will have a small uh, ceremony here in which we will issue certificates to those of you who have attended the class, and inshallah we'll also have a dinner. And we invite you to come out and bring your, your mates as well. And I just want to take this opportunity also to thank you now in advance uh, for your participation in the class and uh, for your diligence in coming out and making this class a success. Inshallah, we could not have made a success out of this, and we do believe that it has been a success without your participation. And I also just want to issue a special thanks to our sister here. Uh, I still don't know her name. She's been here every night uh, because she has been here every night uh, without fail. And so we thank her for her uh, consistency in that area and we also issue a special thanks to our guest who has come out now to join us with us and who has participated with us and contributed to the success of this class also inshallah we thank them all uh, okay inshallah we begin and we notice here that there's a watchtower publication here and we'll deal with this later on in the second issue uh, I mean the second uh, part of our talk uh, Jehovah Witnesses, a cult or ministers of God. Jehovah Witnesses, a cult or ministers of God. So someone has evidently accused them of being a cult. So they want to make and set the record straight. So we'll get to their point of view, inshallah, in a few. But now we're inquiring on the broader perspective because they are a branch of Christendom is Christianity as a whole, Christianity as a whole, a cult? And I'm curious about that because we know that Jesus, peace be upon him, that he practiced a worship, that he had a worship that he implemented, uh, worship and service to God, surrender to God, and we know uh, that it was not Christianity. So if it was not Christianity that he practiced, as we know in modern terminologies of what Christianity entails, we want to know uh, where did this Christianity come from and is it a cult? First thing we want to do is define, define the term cult. What does the term cult mean? And I have three definitions here. Uh, one is worship or religious devotion. Cult. A cult is worship or religious devotion. Another definition is a system of religious observances. A system of religious observances. observances. And thirdly, extravagant devotion to a person, cause, or thing, and the object of such devotion. Now, I believe that in the third definition here, it's going to give us some insight into the question that we're posing tonight, and that is, is Christianity a cult? What is that third definition of a cult? Extravagant devotion to a person. We can stop right there. Extravagant devotion to a person. 
Now, we know right away that there was some semblance of that during the time of Jesus, peace be upon him, that he saw fit to put in check. In Mark chapter 10, verse 17 through 19. In Mark chapter 10, verse 17 through 19, Jesus did something there that would seem to imply that this definition was uh, uh, imp uh, imp imp implicating him as a person to be worshipped or extravagant devotion to be paid to. And there it says in Mark chapter 10, verse 17, it says, and when, he, when he was gone forth into the way, Jesus, peace be upon him, there came one running and knelt to him and asked him, Good master, what must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There's none good but one, and that is God. Don't pay this extravagant devotion to me, running to me and kneeling to me and, and uh, uh, addressing me as good master. So we see that Jesus stemmed the possibility of this man uh, doing some act towards him that might be cultic. Now based on this definition of the word cult, Christianity in my view of the 20th century is no more than a cult founded on the belief in an incarnate virgin-born God called Jesus Christ and the infallibility of his teachings as recorded in the Gospels. I repeat, based on the definition, extravagant devotion uh, towards a person, based on that definition, Christianity of the 20th century is no more than a cult founded on the belief in an incarnate, virgin-born God called Jesus Christ and the infallibility of his teachings as recorded in the Gospels. Now this Jesus cult of Judaism, because, and I say Judaism loosely, because we know for a fact that Moses, peace be upon him, did not practice a religion called Judaism as well. But since we're not going directly into that topic of discussion, we know that for sure, but we'll leave that for now, and we'll just assume assume for the purpose of moving on with our discussion that Judaism was the concept that was practiced. We'll just assume that for now. So we say that those people who followed uh, uh, the law of Moses and who followed uh, 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 Jesus when he came, and worshiping in the temple and in the synagogues and being uh, circumcised and keeping the Sabbath and the law of Moses, the Mosaic law, that that might have been we say Judaism for the sake of our discussion now. So we say that the Jesus cult of Jude Judaism was later to in evolve into a distinctive religion known as Christianity. And by that I mean that those early followers of Jesus, peace be upon him, who later on uh, 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 left that surrounding area there, uh, uh, that immediate area there of Palestine, of Jerusalem at the time, and settled in a place called Antioch and other places, and there was a fellow by the name of Stephen uh, cultivated this new concept which has now evolved into Christianity. It was a branch, a breakaway sect of that main body, what they call uh, the Jerusalem uh, body there, the Jerusalem church they refer to it as. And implemented this concept of Christianity. We know that the Bible teaches that the Christians, as they are now called, were first called that in a place called Antioch. Antioch, that's where they were called that. Now, the Christian church did not begin with popes. There were no popes. There were no archbishops and no district superintendents or ministers of any kind or any establishment or bureaucracy. It did not even start as a church, a church. It started as a sect or a cult. Now, Paul was accused of apostasy and heresy. Paul, when he came among those Jews from Jerusalem with his newfound doctrine, they themselves, those who had associated themselves with Jesus during the time of Jesus, peace be upon him, and who had knew 
the Mosaic teachings, those Pharisees and the scribes and those who had knew the Mosaic teaching, who had knew the teachings that Jesus, peace be upon him, had propagated. And when they heard this new doctrine that Paul was teaching, they accused him, based on their experience and their knowledge and their know, of heresy and of apostasy. And we can find this related in Acts chapter 21, verse 21. Acts chapter 21, verse 21. There it recalls that at Jerusalem, Paul was made aware of the Jewish brethren's concern that he, quote, what does it say there? That he teaches all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs, neither to walk after the customs. This is what they made Paul aware. Look, this is what's going on. You know, the, the people are saying this about you. What do you have to say for yourself? That you teach all the Jews, which are among the Gentiles, to forsake Moses. To forsake Moses. This is what you're teaching them. And what are you saying in regards to that? Saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. They should not do that. They ought not do it. Now, was Paul guilty of that? Was he guilty of those charges? Concerning the law of Moses, Jesus taught. What did Jesus teach, first of all? Concerning the law of Moses. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 18 through 19. Matthew chapter 5, verses 18 through 19. And 18, Jesus says, For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass, not one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, Till all be fulfilled. Jesus is saying, until heaven and earth pass, not one jot or one tittle, not one I should left, be left undotted or one T left uncrossed of the law. So that therefore you don't even get a misconception of the reading of the law. You know, if you write something, you forget to dot, dot, dot the I or cross the T, maybe somebody has now misspelled the word. That word can go into a whole nother concept perhaps. I mean, it's happened in many cases, wherein that you leave off vowels or whatever. And so you get the wrong pronunciation, therefore you get the wrong meaning. So Jesus is so meticulous about the law remaining intact the way it is, that he says, till heaven and earth pass, till heaven and earth pass, and heaven and earth till today still remains. Not one jot or one tittle of the law shall fail till all be fulfilled. And that's in the future. So if anyone would say that, well, Jesus, you know, he came and he fulfilled the law. No, he didn't come and fulfill the law to its completion. Because he says, I have yet many things to say unto you in John chapter 16, verse 12, 13, and 14, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. He will guide you into all truth. He will guide you into all truth. So that therefore, yes, we say that Jesus did come in fulfillment of the law, but he did not fulfill that law so that therefore now it could be replaced by some uh, concepts or some ideas or something of his own person that superseded that. As our Christian brethren will tell us, and we'll come to that in a shortly, that his death on the cross eradicated the law. No. He says now he's here, he knows about the law, and he's telling you that the law still has to be fulfilled and has to be kept intact even in the future. Till heaven and earth pass, not one jot or one tittle of the law shall fail, until all is fulfilled. Then he warns in verse 19 of Matthew 5, he warns, Whosoever therefore shall break one of the least of these commandments, and shall teach men so, he, that person, shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Anybody who thinks that they want to teach people to forsake the law of Moses. Now this is, this forsaking of the law of Moses by Paul is some 20 some odd years later, around 23 to 25 years later, after Jesus is making these statements, then along comes Paul and teaches the people what they've been telling us over here that to forsake the law of Moses. But Jesus, 23 years prior to that, is warning his apostles about anyone who would come. And he doesn't know Paul at the time, but he's warning in case someone comes, whosoever shall break one of the least of these commandments and shall teach other men to break them as well shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Then in Matthew chapter 23, verses 1 through 3, 
What did Jesus uh, say about the law? In Matthew chapter 23, verses 1 through 3, there Jesus spake, and he said, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. The scribes and the Pharisees, they sit in Moses' seat. Moses is not here, peace be upon him, but those scribes who are doctors of the law and the Pharisees, doctors of the law, knowers of the law, they are the authority now. They sit where Moses would be. In other words, they represent Moses in authority over the law. So he says, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. And in verse 3 of Matthew 23, he says, All therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. All. All. Whatsoever they tell you to do, since they sit in Moses' seat, and you know that if Moses, peace be upon him, if he were here and he commanded you to do something, you would do it. So they say they, that Jesus is saying that the scribes and the Pharisees have that authority among you as learned people. They sit in Moses' seat. All, whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, whatever they uh, tell you. And certainly we know that they were going to tell you to keep the commandments and keep the laws and keep the uh, uh, covenant that the contract between God and Moses and the, the, the uh, agreement on Sinai and whatever entail there in those uh, regulations. And we know that Jesus told the, the uh, learned man, the, the lawyer in Luke chapter 10, verse 25, when the lawyer came to Jesus and he stood up and he said, uh, Master, what must I do to have eternal life? And he says, Thou knowest the law. How readest thou? You know the law. How does it read? He said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, all thy strength, and thy neighbor as thyself. And Jesus answered, Thou hast answered, Well, this do, and you shall live. You'll have eternal life. Keeping those laws. You know the law. You know the law. Keep the law, and you'll have eternal life. Eternal life comes through keeping the law. And we just told you about Mark chapter 10, verse 17, where the man said, Good master, what must I do? Not what must I believe, but what must I do to have eternal life? What I got to do to have eternal life? And Jesus quoted off at least six of those commandments that you should do. You should keep them all, but he's just giving you a, an idea of them. He's quoting to you six. You do those commandments, and those commandments will bring you eternal life in doing them and keep doing them till all the breath is gone out of you and they stand till heaven and earth pass away and we know that they stood till what jesus prophesied he the spirit of truth has come he guides you into all truth who we taught in this class in one of our lecture series that that was muhammad sallallahu ibn abdullah who came in uh, uh saudi arabia in the year 571 of the christian era and who brought the deen of Islam, the religion of Islam, and the Quran, which is the all truth to mankind. We discussed that issue here. So, we see that Jesus upheld the law and the validity of the law, and that the law had salvation in it, and that it was to stand. It was not to be abrogated. Abrogated. Not until one was able to abrogate it, and that was the spirit of truth. Now, concerning the law of Moses, peace be upon him, and what Paul taught. What Paul taught. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 11, because Paul was not privileged to hear this uh, lecture from Jesus and to hear these warnings and admonitions from Jesus, peace be upon him. And he has told us himself that concerning the historical Jesus, he was not interested. I think it was in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, somewhere there. He says, I determine not, well, we determine not to know anything of Christ save him and his crucified. Him and his crucified. This is basically all we're interested in. The proof of the pudding is that Paul never really quotes anything from Jesus, peace be upon him, to substantiate any arguments that he has. Whenever someone in all of the, he's written over half of the New Testament. He's written over half of, of the New Testament. 13 to 14 letters, epistles, and whenever he gets in a sticky situation, something that he's being asked, he never goes to quote Jesus, peace be upon him, what Jesus said about the matter. He gives his own information about it. So he's not 
interested in the historical Jesus to know his sunnah, his tradition, what he said and what he did. So concerning the law of Moses as Paul taught it, I mean what Paul thought about it, in Galatians chapter 3 verse 11. Galatians chapter 3 verse 11. There Paul says, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident for the just shall live by faith. This is what he says. Galatians 3.11. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. This is what he said. No man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident for the just shall live by faith. This is what he said. In other words, you cannot earn your salvation. You cannot earn salvation by keeping and doing the dictates of the law. You cannot earn salvation. And that you have to believe in the, the death, resurrection, uh, and atoning uh, sacrifice that Jesus brought. You have to have faith in that. And that's what gives you salvation. Not that you don't do good deeds and you don't uh, practice uh, uh, kindness and, and all of the social uh, uh, upright things that you should do in a community, societal living, but those things you do just out of human nature that you do them. The, it's, in other words, as one person says, it's good to do good. It's the right thing to do. But doing that does not earn you salvation according to Paul. And we know that Jesus said, accept your righteousness. It's, all, it's condition. That is the condition. Accept your righteousness. Exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. You shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. We know that the scribes and the Pharisees, Jesus went on to say, that they sit in Moses' seat and all whatever they dictate to you, you do. But do not after their works. Because they say and they do not. Because they say and they do not. They're hypocrites. So whatever you see them doing, don't follow their actions. You have to be better than them. You have to exceed them. You have to not only know the law, but you have to do the law. They know the law, but they don't do it. You have to exceed them. Now, here in Galatians chapter 3, verse 11, there's been some mistake here in this quotation. It's a misquote. This where Paul says in Galatians 3.11, for the just shall live by faith, is supposed to be taking a quotation from Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. And what does it say there? It says, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Listen to that. It's a very subtle movement across that verse there, but a key word has been taken out of Paul's quotation to change the whole meaning of the word, the whole meaning of the statement. There it says, the just shall live by what? His faith. Not by faith. By his faith. And Paul has said, the just shall live by, by faith. It's a big difference. Now, this statement in Habakkuk does not mean blind faith, but rather a moral or an ethical code. This is what the just shall live by. His ethical code, by his faith, by his ethical code. Then Paul goes on in Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. And there he proclaims what? Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, the Mosaic law, that is, being made a curse for us. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having been made a curse for us. And he goes on to say, for it is written, curse is he that hangeth on a tree. And there he's quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 21, around verse 22, somewhere around in there, that whole business there about uh, the, dis, uh, the uh, disobedient child and his condition. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. 
being made a curse for us. So therefore, he's saying that Christ has he abrogated the law. He's ha he has uh, 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 made the law of no avail, has no effect for you now. And he goes on to say in Galatians chapter 3, verse 24, where therefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. In other words, the law was just a medium, a vehicle, in order to bring you to Christ. But now that you have come to Christ and believed in his death and sacrificial death on the, on the cross and his resurrection, his atoning death, now you are justified by faith. You believe in that. And in verse 25, he says, But after the faith is come, we are no longer under the schoolmaster. You're no longer under the law. So heaven and earth is still here, and Paul is saying the law is no good. Heaven and earth is still here. It hasn't passed away, but Paul has eradicated the law. Jesus said, till heaven and earth pass away, not the law, but one jot or one tittle. And you've gotten rid of the whole law. The whole law. Jesus said, not one jot or one tittle. And whosoever shall break one of the least commandments and teach others shall be called least. And you've taught now, Paul, that all of the commandments, all of the whole law is null and void for your earning salvation. Now, the indictment that was issued against Paul contained another charge, another charge also in Acts chapter 21, verse 21. And there, in modern terminology, it would be like he has one count against him. One count of what? One count of saying in this law of saying that the Jews ought not to circumcise their children. So that's another count. And if he's charged with that and found guilty, that might even be a felony. Might even be worthy of capital punishment even. Who knows? He says that the Jews ought not to circumcise their children as well. Not only did he say the law is null and void, he says the Jews ought not to circumcise their children. In Acts chapter 21, verse 20, 21, this is what the charge was. And Paul pleaded guilty to the charge. He says, I'm guilty as charged. When they bring him up, he says, look, you know, Your Honor, no need to pick a jury and go through all of this long, drawn-out thing and all of that. I'm guilty as charged. The charges against me, yeah, I'm guilty. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 2, he said, you'll find it out anyway because you have the manuscripts here. No need for me arguing against this. Just check Galatians chapter 5, verse 2, and you'll find that I'm guilty of this charge because they charge that he's preventing them from circumcising their children. And there he says, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. But I say unto you, that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. What does it mean? It means that you're still following the law, and don't you know that Jesus died for your salvation? This is Paul's doctrine. Jesus died for your salvation. You don't have to now follow this rigidity of the law and be burdened down with all of that. You have to elevate now your belief to believing in this salvation. Have that mindset that Jesus paid that price for you. But now if you're still running around here circumcising and keeping up the Sabbath and worried about the kosher law and worried about this and that and the dues of the law, then Christ has profited you nothing. What does he profit you? Nothing. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 19, he says, circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but the keeping of the commandments of God. This is what matters. Now, isn't that some double talk? Circumcision is nothing. That don't mean nothing, man. So you've been circumcised, so what? That ain't nothing. And so this guy, he ain't been circumcised, so that ain't nothing. Y'all in the same boat, it ain't really nothing. That ain't nothing. What matters is just keeping the commandments of God. That's what matters. 
And so the commandments of God is now to follow the laws of Moses. Isn't that right? So what kind of double talk is that? The commandments of God is keeping the law of Moses. And Jesus taught you those commandments. He said, thou knowest the commandments. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do that. Till heaven and earth pass away, not this, not that. So what is this going on here now? If you've got to keep the commandments, that means you follow the law. The law is not a curse anymore. And that you should circumcise because circumcision was given in Genesis 17 to be an everlasting covenant between God and his people. The people who believed in the unity of God and oneness of God, this was their contract with God. Circumcision. Anybody who believed in the oneness of God, the signing of that contract was through the foreskin, was circumcising. Now, concerning the heresy charge, in Acts chapter 24, verse 14, Acts chapter 24, verse 14. Paul says there, But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing in all things which are written in the law and the prophets. Y'all are calling it heresy. But this is the way I've been, I'm, I'm practicing. This is what I, the way I worship now. You call it heresy. But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing in all things which are written in the law and the prophets. You have a question? Collect, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, the sentence before this one regarding circumcision, uh, was this a mosaic law of, of circumcision? Was it a law at that time? Like, uh, was it a commandment to circumcise? Yeah. yeah. So if this was a commandment, then according to him in the statement of 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 19, where he's saying that circumcision means nothing, and then in saying, keep the commandments, is he's contradicting him, himself in the, that statement itself? Whoever wrote that is contradicting, evidently, with what we just said, yeah. That's a contradictory concept. If he says circumcision don't mean nothing, that means it doesn't mean anything, you see? And if he says whether you're uncircumcised, it doesn't mean anything. What really means is that you keep the commandments of God. So those are the commandments of God, you see? Because we say it in Genesis chapter 17. It says there in Gen Genesis chapter 17, verse 14, and the uncircumcised man whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. That's the covenant with God. It's a contract with God. If the person who doesn't do it, be not, out of, not out of any illness or any hardship because he, does, he doesn't do it, just because he feels that it's not obligatory for me to do that. It's not required. I don't feel the need to do that. Okay. Then that person now is cut off from the contract with God. It's to be an everlasting contract, this circumcision. Okay. So Thank the you. Jews do it and the Muslims do it as a, an obligation. From God, yes. And uh, my second question is regarding, uh, if you could just explain the word heresy you're using. Uh, I don't understand what's that word. Heresy is any kind of thing that goes that is totally opposed to basic fundamental doctrine. It's like a shirt, you see. You're going, uh, it's, 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 it actually it's like kuf or apostasy. You're going against the basic fundamental co commandments of God, dictates of God, and implementing something else. And so Paul in Acts chapter 21, verses 23 to 26, when he went up to Jerusalem on several occasions, this occasion he was told, because of the charges that was levied against him, he was told by those uh, Jerusalem uh, uh, brothers there, and when we use the term Jerusalem brothers, these are the people who are more uh, uh, associated with Jesus or those immediate followers of Jesus, peace be upon him. Those traditionalists, uh, we might use a concept that scares people today, the fundamentalists. They were the fundamentalists. <laughs> Paul was told to go in and purify himself. 
Look, if you want to keep the people from getting too upset now because they're all upset about what's going on here, you go out and like we call it Itikaf, you go in the synagogue and you stay in there a few days with some other guys. That are there. There's another group over there that need to go with you because they got charges against them too. So you take them and you and y'all go in the synagogue and purify yourself and come out and maybe we'll tell the people, look, the guy's like repented, you know, he's laid up in here for a while. Maybe he re feels remorse and he's going to stop doing what he does. So Paul then kick and scream and say, what are you talking about? You know, I've been appointed by, by Jesus to be an apostle. I have just as much authority as y'all do. And what I'm saying is come direct from Revelation and I'm not going nowhere to purify nothing. He didn't say nothing like that. He went right on in and did as he was told. And now just to conclude on this topic, which is brief here, in Mark chapter 7, verse 6, and go right on to, we go right on in there to 13, Jesus now has warned people about lip service. Lip service. Lip service. Not practicing what you preach. You know, Barry White just made a song about that. <laughs> Here he says there, Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites. As it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. They teach for doctrines. You consider this what you teach, doctrines, and these are the commandments of men. Commandments of men. For laying aside the commandments of God, ye hold the traditions of men. You don't like what God has commanded you. But traditions of men, you have that every day, and we find people doing it every day in their so-called religious practices. Most of what they do is just traditions of men traditions of men, and the commandments of God, they have put those aside. And we find that in all faiths. The Muslims are not excluded from this. The Muslims, not Islam, the Muslims, are not excluded this from this on a worldwide basis. We find that going on too, and that's what we call ignorance. Goes on to say, full well you reject the commandments of God that ye may keep your own traditions, making the word of God of none effect through your, tra tra through your traditions which you have delivered, and many such like things do you, do you do. So you have delivered your traditions in the form of your book as the word of God, when in fact much of what is there in your writings is only the traditions of men. And we'll give our brother Paul some credit for making this statement because we know that he said in Romans chapter 3 verse 7, for if the truth of God is more bounded through my line to his glory, why yet am I judged a sinner? So we discussed that uh, last week when we talked about Paul. And so that therefore on occasions he might have said certain things for certain reasons uh, for, for, for certain purposes, but we'll give him credit for making this statement in conjunction with what we just read as well. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 to 4, where he says there, 2 Timothy 4, 3 to 4, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. The time will, co time will come. People will not endure sound doctrine. Sound doctrine doesn't really have no meaning to them. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, teachers having itching ears. You know, somebody's going to say what I want you to say. And you know, you know, we want our ministers and rabbis and pastors to be of our mindset, of our school of thought. Otherwise, the guy's teaching something, and we feel that look, this is too uh, putting too many obligations, restrictions, and this is too uh, much of the letter of the law. We don't need him. He's too rigid. You know, get somebody a little more lenient. 
For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap unto themselves teachers, having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables, unto myths. And they should turn their ears away from the truth. When he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. So when that's presented to you, you'll turn your ears away from the truth, whatever truth that you have presented, and shall turn unto fables, myths. So much for that topic.